All right, so this week we're going to talk about materials um, or shaders. They are used interchangeably. They're not necessarily the same thing, but I will probably also use them interchangeably. We're just talking about the surfaces of all of the objects that we've spent the last few weeks modeling. So I've got a demo scene open here, uh, and these are what are known as shader balls, uh, and therefore kind of evaluating uh, the materials that you're creating in your building. If you actually open up the Hypershade, uh, Hypershade has its own version right here in the, in the top right um, in the material viewer. It just lets you kind of see what it looks like on a variety of different surfaces with um, inside corners, outside corners, insets, um, you know, sharp corners, smooth surfaces, flat uh, surfaces. It gives you an idea of what a material will look like from a bunch of different angles in, in on a, a bunch of different details. So that's why we have them there. Um, now this particular one uh, comes from masteringcgi.com.au. It was free online, and so that's why we're using it. Um, so uh, before we get to that, I just want to kind of give you a quick overview of the scene. There's a few things here we haven't covered. Um, I just want you to understand what's going on. So this scene is... Uh, there's just a textured plane, and uh, the texture is really incidental. Uh, and then there's this large sphere with an image applied to it. Uh, this is actually what's lighting the scene. Uh, what you can do is you can add a, a Sky Dome light. If you look at the outliner right here, it's called Sky Dome Light 1. You can add a Sky Dome light and apply an image to it, and then Maya will project that image as as a light source into the scene. And it's a great way to get realistic um, lighting, scene lighting effects um, as a general starting point uh, for your scenes. So this is created with what, what are called uh, equa rectangular uh, images. Uh, also, they can be referred to as HDRI images. Now, I've posted a link to this on D2L uh, called HDRI Haven. And if you go to HDRIs, they also have a bunch of textures. But if you go to HDRIs, uh, we've got a bunch of different settings. And you can see uh, what they look like and kind of what they look like on, on various objects. And you can see how the light in the scene is reflected on each of the spheres. And again, it's this is the only thing that's creating light in these scenes. You can see that the the sun here is in a specific spot and you can see that spot is reflected on each of these spheres uh, and then the parts where there's less light okay end up being a little bit darker so to add one of these in Maya uh, the way that this works and I can just select this and I'm just gonna really quickly look at the attributes so I can replicate this if I need to or I can just undo it uh, so, if we go to the Arnold tab, and Arnold is, is uh, what we're using for rendering, and I'll talk about the rendering here in a moment. But if we go to the Arnold tab, the fourth option here is create a sky dome light. So we click on that and we get a dome. And by default, that dome is just white. Uh, but if we go to, in the attribute editor, in the color, we can apply a texture. And we can go and we can choose a file texture. It'll bring up this window. We can click on the file folder. And we can choose uh, an HDR image. There's That's the one that we were using. Click open. And there it is. And then you can select it and you can actually adjust the lights. Don't really worry too much about this right now. Um, We'll talk more about this when we actually talk about lighting. I just want you to understand what's going on in this scene. And if you want to start playing around with it, uh, you can. So that's where the light is coming from in the scene. Uh, as far as there's no camera, there was a camera in the scene, I deleted it, because we don't really need to worry about that right now. We'll just use the, the perspective view as our camera. Um, and the last thing that I want to cover before we start playing around with materials and talking about what materials are and how they work, 
uh, when you're creating materials, you need to be able to evaluate evaluate them accurately. And with Arnold or, or with most render engines, um, with the exception of maybe some real time, you need to render the scene in order to really understand what the what the material is going to look like. Just the preview in the viewport is not going to be enough. It's not going to be. Sometimes it's kind of close, and sometimes it's not even remotely close. Um, so you need to understand how to render. Uh, up until now, we've just been dealing with the Maya software renderer. So if, uh, I want to open up the render options. And the shortcut here is uh, in this section of the top toolbar, uh, we've got this slate with a little gear icon. That's re your render settings. You can also get there if you go to Windows, rendering, uh, render editor, rendering editors, and render settings. Okay. So, uh, by default, Maya is set to using the Maya software renderer, and we've got a couple tabs with with some options, but really not a ton. And by default, I'm just going to click render on the scene, which is going to be the second. Uh, icon right here. It's two over from render settings. Okay, it's just this blank film slate here. I'm just going to click on that to render. Uh, and you can see this is what the scene looks like. It looks terrible. But that's how it renders. Okay, I'm going to click this button to, to save that image. Uh, now I'm going to change render settings from Maya Software to Arnold Renderer. That's the only change I'm making and I'm going to hit render again. I'll take a second. Of course, since I'm recording, it might even take longer than a second. Um, so I will pause and we'll come back. Okay. So with no no other changes, it's changing the render engine. And the engine is just how the light is calculated, how the scene is calculated. Um, you can see what the difference. So this is Maya software, and this is uh, with Arnold. And obviously, you can see the background changes, but that's not that important. I'm more focused on the light and the shadows here. If you look at the quality of the shadows, you know the, the software render doesn't have any by default, especially with this lighting um, configuration. You know, I guess it would be probably a slightly more fair uh, if we got rid of it, but that's nah, not worth the time. Um, the, the, the shadows are more accurately uh, calculated, lighting in general is more accurately calculated um, based on f how light actually works in the real world. Uh, so the render engine can make a huge difference, and Arnold is a very powerful one. Uh, what they actually used for uh, the new Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse film, which is what? just a masterpiece. Cool. So, and, and again, um, We'll get more into Arnold's render settings as it becomes necessary. Uh, but the important thing is to make sure that you set your render settings to Arnold uh, because Arnold has its own material or, or shaders that we're going to be using. And so we need to be rendering with Arnold to actually see how great they look. Okay. So, materials. So materials are the basically what your objects are made out of, if you think of them as, as real things. So um, it's, not, it's not the texture. It's, you know, is something metallic or is it plastic? Um, is it waxy? Is it, is it shiny or is it, um, are there no, no highlights or reflections on it? Um, does light go through it? Is it is it transparent, or is it opaque? Um, these are the sorts of things that we're talking about when we're talking about materials, shaders, surfaces, things like that. Uh, I've linked on D2L the Arnold uh, su support page. Okay, uh, docs.arnoldrenderer.com, and. Uh, if you ever have any questions about how Arnold is working, this is the place to go. It has documentation for everything. I'll be referring to it as we're talking about the different aspects of, of these um, shaders. But that's, that's what shaders are. Is they are um, it's basically some algorithms that tell Maya how light interacts with the surface. 
and then you've got your user settings. That's how you can define color. This is how you can define um, glossiness, transparency, something called subsurface scattering, uh, emission if it's going to be emitting any light, uh, and various other attributes that we will at least partially um, get into. If you've done any 3D work before, you might be familiar with uh, shaders such as the Fong or, or Blin, um, Lambert's, things like that. We're going to be using the standard surface shader, which is an Arnold shader, um, which is just better in every way. So uh, it's, it's kind of good in a sense that you don't have to worry about adding other shaders. You just need to add one, and then you can adjust the settings to get a, a really wide variety of looks. I mean, all of these are made with just this standard surface shader. Um, and there are a bunch of different attributes. So I linked it on D2L. I encourage you to, to browse through it or even you know follow along with it as we go. Uh, but now let's actually just start adding things. So I'm going to start with this first shader ball. And I'm going to select both main parts. I'm not going to worry about the ring or the inside sphere, just the two outside parts. And to add a new material to an object, I'm just going to pull down the right mouse button and go to Assign New Material. Okay, and that's going to open up this window. And this window is all the different things that you can add to it. We're only concerned about this Arnold shader section. Okay, surface shader is what we're working with. And AI Standard Surface. That's the only one we need to worry about. So I'm going to click on that, and it's going to create a new shader. Now, in this case, it's called Standard Surface 8. Uh, I'm going to immediately rename that to uh, Diffuse. Okay, it's going to be just a Diffuse shader. Uh, and so you can make these adjustments that I'm about to make either in the Attribute Editor, just on that Shader tab. You can also open up the Hypershade Editor which I will do right now. I remember way back on week one we did the solar system. We worked in here briefly. Uh, we'll do a little bit more work in here today. So uh, in the Hypershade, we have all of the different shaders that are in the scene are just listed right here. Uh, and it can take the previews a while to load in, which is kind of frustrating. But all of, all of your shaders are up here, all your materials. Um, and you can see we've got tabs for, for various other components, but we're just going to worry about materials. Uh, down here on the left side, we have the Create menu. So this is the same thing that, that opened up when I right-clicked on the object. Um, you can see we've got Maya shaders, which, which we don't want to worry about. We just want to deal with Arnold, Shader, and you can see our standard surface is right there. Uh, and here is the Node Editor. Uh, we're not going to worry about nodes right now. And then on the right here is the property editor, which is where we'll make all of our adjustments. So that's the, that's the real quick overview of the Hypershade. Uh, I'm going to close it for now. We don't really need to worry about it. I'm just going to be working in the attribute editor. Feel free to work in whichever one is easier for you. Uh, for me, since I have limited screen real estate, this is easier. OK. So the last thing that I need to do is preview uh, the changes that I'm about to make. So I'm going to use the Arnold render view. And what I want to do is I want to click this uh, in the Arnold tab. I'm going to click on the render button. And it's going to take a second. There we go. It'll pop up uh, and it'll render the, the view real quick. Now it's, it's doing a really basic render. Um, and it's going to be kind of slow since I'm recording. Arnold render view, this actually calculates what the scene looks like. And you can see there's a pretty stark difference between what it looks like in the viewport and what it looks like rendered. Right? There's a lot, a lot going on um, in the background with Arnold to calculate all of these highlights and reflections. I'm just going to jump back into the render settings. I have my render settings set at my image size is just the HD 540 preset. And then in the Arnold renderer, my sampling is set to 3, 2, 2, 2, 2, and then 3 on subsurface scattering, but don't worry about that. 
for now. Um, if you want a little bit more detail, you can see it's kind of noisy here, especially in the shadows. You can increase your sampling, but as you do so, it will drastically slow down the render. Uh, and just for the purposes of this recording, I'm just going to leave it where it is. So we've got our object. We have our render view of that object. And oops, now I want to select my diffuse. Okay, so to select the object, the, the shader tab will pop up in the attribute editor. And now we can actually start making some changes. So the first section that I want to worry about, we're just going to work our way down, is the base, just the base attributes. Okay, and the first option here we have is a weight. This weight ref um, refers to the influence that this section has over the final result. So I'm going to turn specular, which refers to these kind of bright highlights. I'm going to turn the specular weight off. I don't want to worry about that right now. When I do that, you can see those specular highlights disappear. And now we're just left with this base value. I'm going to set the weight all the way up to 1. Okay. It's going to brighten that up a little bit because it's using the full uh, influence of this base setting. And perhaps the most obvious setting for materials in any form is color. This is where we can set that color. You've got full control uh, over whatever color that you want to use. You can use a color picker. It'll remember your most recently used colors. Uh, maybe we'll go something like this. Uh, as you are deciding on your colors, I would caution against using pure white or pure black. Nothing in the real world is ever pure white or pure black. Um, if you do, if you use pure white, it's going to look blown out, uh, and you're just not going to really see any details. If you use pure black, it's also going to feel kind of fake. So, you know, I wouldn't go all the way down to black. I would, you know, still give it something. Oops. Okay, but this is where you can set the, those colors. Uh, I'll go. That looks fine. Okay. Uh, you can also adjust the roughness, and the roughness is, you know, surfaces in, in in real life have kind of micro detail on them. Even if they appear smooth, if you were to really zoom in with a microscope, you would see that there would still be some variations in them. Um, and that variation can vary, de uh, variation can vary depending on uh, the specific material. So some plastics are a little bit more porous uh, versus, say, glass or a pol polished stone might be really smooth. Um, that's what roughness refers to. And really, as we adjust this roughness, you can see like if, I, if I'm all the way at zero, we can kind of see the differences here, the lighter parts of this teal versus the darker parts, and the, yeah, there's shadows. But um, as we increase this roughness, things flatten out a bit. Um, you know, a higher roughness tends to work better for things like concrete, um, plaster. You know, if you think of these more porous materials. Again, I'm going to jump back here to the to the documentation. I'm in. I clicked on the base settings, so we're now we're just dealing with the base. We've got a really great uh, kind of layout of how each of these settings affect the result. Um, so again, keep that in mind as as a reference as you're going through and trying to figure out what settings that you want. Uh, so that's roughness, and then we've got metalness. And metalness, as you might expect, is to make things look metal. So I crank that all the way up. Now we've got a very metallic, uh, a metallic -y teal looking things. So um, the metalness. You can. You don't have to go all the way up to one. You can go part way. Um, but if we go all the way up to one, then you can see that the diffuse roughness value grays out. So I've got it really rough, but if 
I bring the metalness all the way up, that grays out. That's no longer a factor. Um, now it's going to start working with specular. And we'll get to that here in a second. Um, but that's what metalness can do. And then, again, we go back to the Arnold documentation with metalness. I've got this great chart. If you're looking to replicate specific metals, um, what you should set your base color and your specular color at uh, and the results that you can get. So, um, but for now, if we're just dealing with base, I'm going to set the metalness all the way down to zero, and I'll bring the roughness up maybe a little bit, but I'm just going to leave it like that. Okay, so we got this, it almost feels kind of rubbery, um, is, is what this material or this shader feels like right now, and that's just with the base values. So now... Let's select the next shader ball over, and I'll move the camera over there. You'll notice that as you move the camera, the Arnold renderer updates dynamically, which is nice. Uh, okay, so now this one, I just want to focus on the specularity. So again, with the two main pieces selected, I'm going to hold down the right mouse button. Whoops and go to Assign New Material, Shader, and Standard Surface Shader. Okay, we'll call this one Specular. And I'm going to turn the base weight down to zero, and we're just going to deal with Specular settings. So, uh, Specular you can kind of think of as, uh, as the reflections. Um, it's not quite I mean, it is a reflection, but it's more than that. Um, you can see all the highlights from the scene, and you can see the little points of light. You can see uh, the the image that's lighting the scene. You can see the windows. Uh, along the edges, you've got these nice kind of linear highlights. We've got the streaks down here. And you can even see the grid floor reflected and even the shader ball next to it reflected in the surface, especially if I... Uh, you know, move in closer here. You can see that shader ball is right there. Okay, so there's there's a specular. Uh, if I turn the weight all the way down to zero, you can see all those go away, and now it's just this black void because there's there's not really anything affecting it. It's there's no base color, there's no specular color, there's no light reflecting off the surface at all. Uh, and you can go anywhere in between, to, depending on how intense you want these uh, specular highlights to be. You can also adjust the color of the specular highlights. Now this is something that I would do very sparingly, uh, because most things have a monochromatic um, specular highlight. So you can maybe bring it down a little bit, but I wouldn't make it, let's say, red. I wouldn't make, make whoops, I actually need to turn it red. There we go. I wouldn't make the specular highlights red. Okay, that's not a, a, a physically accurate um, thing to do. Really the only place uh, that you will change the color, again, is going back to metal. And we go back to that base setting. You can see this is that specular color setting uh, that Arnold is referring to. But for the most part, you'll leave that at white. And then just the int uh, adjust the intensity of it. Uh, next we have a, a roughness setting. Now this is going to be a bit more obvious than the diffuse roughness. We do that and now we can see now we've got a, a rougher. This almost feels like a like a matte powder coating uh, finish here. That's about half roughness. If we go all the way up, now there's you know it's a very flat more chalkboard like uh, as we're going through and, and, and playing around and exploring these settings for the first time. Start thinking about what materials these look like at, at various intervals. Uh, you know, as, as you're playing with it, you're like, oh, this does look like a, a powder-coated metal that you might see on, like, a bike frame. You know, remember that. Tuck that away. Write it down. Whatever you need to do uh, so that when that comes up, you, can, you know what to do. Okay. So I'm going to bring this roughness back down. Um, I usually won't be at the extreme on either one. 
you know, usually things are not perfectly mirror shiny, and they're also usually not completely dull. I'm going to keep it, uh, actually, I'll, I'll turn it off for now just to help demonstrate with the next thing. Uh, and that's going to be IOR. IOR stands for Index of Refraction. Uh, and this refers to uh, where the highlights or where the specular highlights are on the object. So I'm going to go back to our documentation because it's got a great example here. So this uh, it defines the material's Fresnel reflectivity. Um, don't worry too much about exactly what that means, but if we look at the pictures, I think it's got a great demonstration. So the default is 1.5, and we can see that the sky here is perfectly um, reflected, but as we bring this value down, we start to lose those highlights and those reflections in the center of the sphere. And then as we bring it all the way down to 1, we really only see those highlights around the edges. Okay, you can think about this uh, with like a window on your house. If, you, if you're standing right in front of the window and you look out of it, you can see outside. But if you go to the kind of at an angle and look across the window, you don't, it's, it becomes harder to see outside. You see more reflection than you do, um, you know, uh, through the window. And that's kind of what this is doing. Uh, is this index of refraction can define at what angle you actually see through versus... Uh, the reflection of the window. Okay, so with the default, we're seeing reflections everywhere. Uh, with the value of one, we're kind of seeing through the object uh, and only seeing the reflections around the edges. Okay, and again, we can we can actually make those adjustments in here. So if we go closer to one, we get those specular highlights around the edges, but not in the center. And as we bring it up, they come back towards the center. And then we can go uh, even further, but unless we're transparent, I don't think we're really going to see too much difference here. Um, I will also note that you can actually look up uh, IOR values. These are things that ha have real values. So if we just search IOR values, See, water typically has an index of refraction of 1.333. Glass is between 1.5 and 1.7. Diamond is 2.4. Um, then these are transparent or translucent materials. Uh, so as you're as you're working with those sorts of things, keep that in mind. You can get really accurate with with those values. Um, one thing with these. In general, normals are really important, but especially when we get into materials and shading, making sure your normals are facing the correct direction is going to be very important to getting accurate um, results from these shaders. Uh, the last two things here on specular uh, are uh, anisotropy and rotation. And for that, uh, no, well, never mind. Uh, so anisotropy is a word for elongated highlights, basically. So let's see if we can't... I'm going to need to increase this roughness here just a little bit. There we go. Alright. So if we watch this, watch the reflections here. When it's at zero, it's off. And we can see these kind of circular hot spots. But as I increase the anisotropy, you can see they start to stretch out and they get longer. That's what anisotropic refers to, is uh, these elongated highlights. Think of brushed metal, brushed aluminum. Um, that's what this is. And so we can increase that, increase the amount of that stretch, and it'll probably be even clearer if I go around to the back side of this sphere. Okay, so we can see that that stretch in there. Whoops, that's the wrong thing. Okay, again, without it and with it. We can also adjust the rotation of that stretched effect. 
Okay, so as I bring that up, you can see that it is changing the direction that it's going. And if I bring it all the way up to one, that's like rotating it 180 degrees. So one will look very similar to zero. So that's an uh, anisotropy. But I'm going to turn that off for now. And we're just going to leave leave the shader just like this. And that'll be our kind of demonstration of what specular does. So we've got uh, diffuse and we've got specular. Now let's, uh, let's combine the two and we'll make a metal, a metallic shader. And we can do this. Um, we'll use one of the, one of the presets that Arnold recommends. So we're going to go to the third shader ball. Select both parts and add a new material. Again, Arnold, standard surface. And we'll call this metal. Okay. So this metal, uh, we'll, use, um, we'll use one of these presets that Arnold recommended. Uh, so let's go with, we'll go with aluminum or copper. So, I know in my, um, I'll turn my base all the way up. I'm going to set my metalness to one. Oh, we'll turn on Arnold Render View so we can watch how this changes. So, metalness to one. The base color. Uh, Arnold recommends having values of, oops, we want, we want this to be, RGB will go 0 to 1 and then we've got R of 0.926 and green of 0.721 and re uh, blue of 0.504 okay so there's our copper base color and our metalness Oops, let's zoom in here specular uh, Arnold suggests that we use a specular color. Again, RGB 0 to 1. Oops. We want to go 0 0.996, 0 0.957, and 0 0.823. There we go. And so that's going to tint the highlights just a little bit. It's subtle, um, but it is there. So there's our, whoops, I didn't want to close that. Let that load. So there's our copper. Now right now this looks like pristine, polished, brand new copper. Um, so let's rough it up a little bit. Okay, so now it's not perfectly polished. And let's add some anisotropy. Okay, we can even, we can make it really rough if we want. Also, I don't think this copper is feeling coppery enough. So I'm gonna change the base color. I'm just gonna add in a little bit more red to it. Just a little bit. Add some more anisotropy. Something like that. Okay. And so we've got a, a kind of a brushed copper feeling uh, shader right there. All right, so that's our copper, and we can take a zoom out here real quick and just see all of our materials so far. Lovely. Uh, now let's talk about the transmission section. So I'm going to zoom in here on the fourth one. And right click, assign new material. 
again, standard surface, and we'll call this transmission. And so what transmission is, oh, let me bring up our render view here. Uh, I'm not going to turn down, well actually, yes, I am going to turn off base. Um, yeah, we can turn off specular for now as well. Uh, so transmission, as we turn that weight up, is the trans kind of like transparency, um, but it's transparency with weight to it. All right, so it's not like you're just making something invisible; it's that you're making something see through. Transmission refers to the fact that light is transmitting through the object. Okay. Now, an important thing with transmission, very important thing, if you want this transmission to be accurate, right now you can see this large black spot in the center. We need to tell Maya that this object is going to be transparent. So what you need to do is select the object that you have this transparent uh, shader applied to, or transmission transmissive shader applied to. Go to the shape node in the attribute editor and go to the Arnold section. There's a checkbox that says opaque. You want to turn that off. And watch what happens when I turn that off. There we go. Now we can see through this outer sphere into the sphere inside. All right, I'll do that one more time because uh, we need to do that for this bottom object. So we're going to select the object. And then in the attribute editor, in the shape node, so shader base geo shape, you want to go down to the Arnold section and uncheck opaque. And again, I'll, I'll pull up the render view so you can see this, the difference here. Okay, if you see a bunch of black spots that you don't expect, check that opaque uh, button. That could be the reason why. Yeah, so now that we have transmission set up, things are looking pretty good. Uh, so let's go back to our transmission settings and look at the options that we have here. So we've got weight, and weight is just the amount of uh, transmission in the object. So it doesn't have to be fully uh, transparent. We can just have it be a little bit transparent or go all the way up. So it's how much that light is scattering through the surface. Um, we have color options. Arnold does recommend that you don't go overboard with the colors that you choose, so, so choose more subtle things. Um, but let's say we have that. Uh, teal is probably too much. I'm also going to go back to HSV because it's kind of an easier way to work. So let's go with maybe a blue. Okay. So we can adjust the, uh, the color of the transmission. Uh, you'll also notice that in some of these thicker parts, like particularly at the base here, that blue is more intense than it is at some of the thinner parts. Okay, because the longer the light's in, in the object, the, the more color it's going to pick up. Uh, the other thing that you'll note about transmission is the shadows. The shadows will actually pick up the color uh, of the of the object. So if we make this a much more obvious blue, you can see these shadows now have a blue tint to them. That's because the white light is going through the object, picking up that blue color, and then on the way out, now you see that blue color as the shadow. Uh, again, going back to our documentation here, uh, this uh, uh, about third of the way down the page, we've got the, these two side-by-sides. And this demonstrates um, that point exactly. It also demonstrates why you need to make sure you uncheck that opaque box. So this is the same sphere. That's the only difference is that here the opaque box is checked and here it isn't. So with if you don't uncheck that opaque box, you can see the light isn't actually going through the object. And you still get these solid dark shadows underneath because that light just isn't getting there. Whereas with opaque disabled, that light is going through 
um, reaching the base of the sphere there, but is also turning blue because that's the color of the object that that, that light is going through. Okay. Uh, so that is the, I'm going to back this color off a bit. Again, something a little bit more subtle. Uh, that is the color. Depth is, um, well, I'll just, I'll read it from the website. It controls the depth into the volume at which the transmission color is realized. So it's, you can kind of think of it as, as adjusting like the scale of the object, because as you increase the depth, it makes it a little bit thinner. Okay, so you can see there's a lot less of that color coming through, whereas if I bring that depth down, okay, that light doesn't have to go as far to, to pick up that color. And by default, uh, that's just set to zero. Um, but yeah, you can think of it as kind of a scale factor for the object. Uh, again, this documentation has great examples of the difference of, of depth and how that, that can affect the feel. So this feels, with a depth of one, it feels really dense. Um, if we go up to 10, that feels like that could may, maybe be like a hollow plastic. And then you've got this gift down here that also shows the increasing or, um, of, the, of the depth, yeah. So that's the depth. Um, you do also have a scatter option. And scatter is for any object where you have... Um, th think of it like, like honey or like a muddy river where there's some body to the liquid um, and the light just doesn't go straight through. So if you, we'll just increase that and you can kind of see what that does. We'll, we'll increase it. We need to have some depth in order for this to, to work. So I'll bring the depth up to We'll say seven, and we'll increase that scatter. And now it's kind of feeling a little milky, a little murky. Okay, and we can go all the way up. You know, so maybe if if we bring that color to more neutral, and then we set the scatter color here. So maybe to go to like a darker brown. Let's see what that looks like. That's not nearly dark enough. Bring that depth down. Nah, it's not the right color set. I'll just use the example again. Okay, so if you thicker viscous liquid, so oil, honey, um, you can see how that. To me, it lo just looks like a muddy river. Um, but that's the, that scatter value there. Okay, you also have scatter uh, anisotropy. Okay, that works similar to the way it does on the surface. Um, it's maybe not quite as obvious. But that is there. Uh, the next one is called Dispersion Abe, I think is how you say that. I don't actually know. <coughs> um, you can think of this as like chromatic aberration. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll look back at, at this documentation because it shows it very clearly. Um, you can see this color fringing. All right, this It's almost like a prism effect. And they use, use diamond as like the... the biggest example of where this is useful, uh, where you see that separation in color channels. So if I just increase that, okay, this, here's a low value. You can see even the noise while it renders um, gets some of that. OK, 
Okay, you can see these highlights have, have that banding. You know, get that kind of rainbow effect. And that's at a really low value. Again, zero is off, so you don't see any of it. But if you go just even a little bit up, and you're going to see a lot of that. And then as you go and increase that even more, you're going to see much less of that banding, but it'll still be there a little bit. Uh, and then you can add some extra roughness kind of below the surface if you want, and that's what that last slider is for. So that's transmission. Uh, I'll leave it... I'm going to leave dispersion off just because it slows down the render uh, a bit. For a couple more here pretty quick. Uh, the next one is going to be subsurface. So again, I'm going to grab this object, the new one, new material, and standard surface. We will rename it to subsurface and move our camera over so we're looking at the right th one. Can we just hit F to frame it up too? That works. Okay, so subsurface. Uh, subsurface is when light enters an object and kind of just bounces around. So subsurface scattering is something that is um, integral to getting realistic looking skin, but it also pops up in milk, in wax. Uh, actually, if we go here, okay, here's a picture of a candle, if you can't tell. Uh, and we can see that the light comes in and, and kind of on the edges, it's really bright. But as it gets closer, you know, or as we move more towards the center of the candle, less light is penetrating it and it's a little bit darker. This is that subsurface scattering uh, effect. So, you know, here's, here's the main kind of uh, examples here. Uh, let's see. Okay, we can see a bunch of different skins, whole milk, even ketchup. You can kind of see it on the rim there, potatoes. Uh, it's, and you, it's most often apparent when the light is coming from behind. So if you think when the sun's hitting somebody behind the ear and their ear looks like it's glowing red, and um, that's subsurface scattering. The light is entering the, the ear, and it's bouncing around, and it's uh, kind of illuminating the blood, and that's why you're seeing that red color. Subsurface scattering isn't just for skin. It also can be useful for realistic plastics. Uh, you know, we look back up here with these Lego bricks. You can see with and without, or with and without uh, subsurface scattering, the life that it kind of gives the scene and... and makes it feel more like plastic because we get some of that subtle internal illumination there. So uh, to use it, you need to turn the weight all the way up. And let's say we'll give this a base color of maybe a lighter blue. Okay. And then our subsurface color, let's maybe make it like a deep purple, maybe. Now, subsurface is also heavily dependent on the scale of the object, because um, it is calculating light. So depending on the size of the object, will determine the effect of it. So as you adjust the radius, uh, in the scale, you will see significant differences in the effect. Okay, so here's uh, here's just a preset in, in in Arnold, which I'll talk about presets here in a minute. Um, but this kind of gives you a better idea than anything I can do really quickly <coughs> uh, on the fly. So with the weight all the way up, you can see what it does. Let me copy this color. Oops. Okay. So I'm going to set the base color to the same thing. It's not going to make a difference because when the subsurface is all the way up, you can see that that weight isn't doing anything. 
Um, but here it is without any subsurface scattering. Kind of just looks plasticky. And then I'm going to turn the weight up. It feels more fleshy as it renders. Uh, the, also, the thing about subsurface scattering is it needs a little bit more. Um, it needs more samples. It needs more time to render. So if we go to the render settings, SSS, that's your subsurface scattering. I'm going to bump that up a little bit. Just one. Hopefully get a little bit more detail out of that. It also, subsurface scattering takes a while to render. Um, so the more of it you have in the scene, the, the longer it'll take, and, and sometimes significantly so. Um, that's subsurface scattering, and I don't really want to sit around here and wait for it. Um, I'll just refer you to, again, the documentation for examples on, on how it works and the best practices for using it. Um, you can see these more uh, would feel like resin sculpts. I can see what subsurface scattering does to those. Uh, it's a super cool and, and, and powerful tool to, to get that extra bit of realism as you start getting subsurface scattering looking more realistic um, and more accurate. Okay, so there's our subsurface scattering as it goes. Uh, now, the other ones, I don't. I think I'll just leave for today. Uh, you know, we've got. So I'll, I'll just briefly talk about them. Coat is if you wanted to add like a clear coat over the top. So car paint is something that would use use this, where you've got your base color um, that is shiny in itself, but then there's a second clear coat over the top of that to give it a secondary uh, specular reflection, secondary highlight. Emission, you can have the objects actually emit light. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll go back to the uh, to our diffuse model here. And we can turn on emission. And you can see it lights up. We can see a little bit of glow around the edge. I wouldn't use this to light a scene. Um, but if you want it to look like it is glowing, emission is the way to go. If you wanted to actually light the scene with the object, there's another way you can actually make that mesh a light, but we'll talk about that next time. Um, that's emission. And then geometry, the thing I want to call out here is bump mapping. And bump mapping, again, we'll probably touch on it a little bit next time. But bump, bump mapping is a way to fake texture. Uh, without actually having to add geometry. And so what you can do is you apply a texture, and we'll just add a basic noise texture here. Uh, and you can see now that object looks, oops, we'll zoom out here. Probably need to back that depth off a little bit. But we will see. I'm just going to adjust this a little bit. Okay, it's real subtle in the render, especially since it's taking its time. Um, but it's a way to to fake surface detail without actually having to model it. And again, next week we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit. We're not going to get into adding textures a ton, but I do want you to know that it is there and, and, and where it is if you do decide to go down that path. You can kind of see it, see those bumps here. But, yeah. uh, so that is, those are kind of uh, the biggest settings that you'll be using and can get you uh, pretty far. I'm going to undo that, adding that texture because that's terrible. There we go. Okay. So there's a bunch of um, basics that we have. The last thing to show with Arnold is that there are presets built in. And so what you can do is I'll grab this last one, which I haven't touched yet. We can, once again, whoa, no, just back to object mode. 
add a new material, go to standard surface, and then here it says presets, click on that, and we've got a bunch of different presets. And I show you these not so that you can only use these in your scenes, but because they're a great starting point. So uh, let's say you wanted something to look like a really viscous fluid. Honey is a great starting point. So go to Honey, you click Replace. And with Honey, we probably need to tell this not to be opaque. And also, it looks like the scale value is off. There is some transmission, but it uh, looks like I didn't choose a great one for this uh, example. Let's maybe increase the transmission a little bit there. This honey is supposed to use some transmission, but it doesn't appear. Probably just don't have enough light in the scene. Let's grab another preset. Let's grab. We can do clear water. Okay, so if there's just a glass of water, that's a great preset for that. Um, we've got metallic, or we've got regular car paint. Let's start with that. Let me close that and relaunch it since it doesn't appear to have loaded. Uh, sometimes as you're adjusting these settings, the Arnold renderer won't update automatically, so you just have to close it and relaunch it. Is this just not applying my settings? Oh, there we go. Okay. So here's our car paint. You can see it's super shiny and, and glossy. And then next to it, Let's add metallic car paint, and you can see the difference. So new material, standard surface, preset, metallic car paint, and there is the metallic version of car paint. Okay. And obviously, once you add them, um, that's when you can go and really customize them and, and make it what you want. So maybe we want a red. red car, make it a little bit more intense there. We also need to adjust the specular highlights like that. Okay. And now we can see that's looking like a nice shiny red car. So uh, again, let me just, I'm going to set up a larger render here just so you can see everything looking a little bit better. We'll just, uh, we'll just do 720, and I'll set that to 4, 3, and 3, and 3. Okay, so just while this renders, um, this is, for this, this semester, we're really just going to worry about using the Arnold Standard Surface Shader. Um, we're not really going to worry about textures. There's a couple ways we can add them easily, but I don't want to get into UV unwrapping or, or anything there. So, um, but you can see you can you can get a wide variety of textures with this. Um, that'll get you most of the way. You can apply these materials or these shaders to whole objects. You can also apply them to individual faces. Okay. Uh, you know, if you just want to apply this to an individual face. We just have to, let's say, on this object. Of course, these are really tiny faces. Here, we'll do this. We'll go on the on the ground plane. Let's say I want this face to be copper. I just have to select the face and assign existing material. And I choose my metal. And now that's copper. Okay. Now, uh, the Arnold render view didn't refresh, so I just have to close that down and reload it. It'll take a second, uh, and then it'll pop back up. At least it should. There it goes. Cool. So now I have a copper face uh, on my floor. But I'm going to undo that because I don't want that. Um, so play around with it. 
really spend some time figuring out what each of the sliders do and not just, you know, with me telling you what they do, but actually move the sliders around, apply the shaders to objects, uh, get a feel for it. Again, that documentation is, is invaluable uh, for this sort of thing and, and understanding how, uh, how the shader works, how it responds to, to different inputs and different settings. So, uh, we're not here next week, but in two weeks, we'll come back and we'll talk more about lighting and shaders and rendering.